Hello, everyone. My name is Chris with National Parents Organization. Today, I'm here with Dr. Sanford Braver. He is a uh, professor, uh, emeritus professor of psychology at Arizona State University. He's a researcher and advocate for shared parenting. Uh, and Dr. Braver also won the 2021 Ned Holstein Shared Parenting Research Award, which we're going to talk about a little bit. Very excited to have him on today. Uh, Dr. Braver, thank you for coming on and talking with us. Yeah, I was a uh... Professor of psychology at Arizona State University for my entire career. I started in 1970. I retired in 2010, so I worked for 40 years. Since then, I've still been active doing um, uh, research and writing and giving presentations and so forth. Um, I, in approximately 1985, I began working on in the divorce area, and um, I uh, have done uh, really quite a substantial amount of research uh, on that, really concentrating mostly on divorced fathers. And in fact, uh, I have a, a book called Divorced Dads, Shattering the Myths, that was published in 1998. Um, so my specialty was taking that little niche of, uh, of, of topic and trying to understand that better. And when I started this work, um, the consensus amongst the experts was that um, da divorced dads were sort of a bad lot. <laughs> they had a lot of, uh, they, they were, they misbehaved in, in various ways. They didn't pay their child support. They didn't visit their children. They were footloose and fancy free. They were the ones who caused the divorce and so forth. And as I did more and more research, um, most, uh, most of which were, by the way, funded by federal grants, and they usually used um, random samples of families that were getting divorced in the area in which I lived, um, but we approached them during the getting divorced period and then followed them for a period of years. And we found that most of those um, ideas or preconceptions about divorced dads were misinformation. Um, they were myths. And so um, they were wrong. <laughs> Either, either absolutely wrong in the sense that they were totally on the wrong side of saying something, or they were questionable. For example, in the child support are arena, it was thought that there were mostly, most, de most divorced dads were deadbeat dads who didn't pay their child support. Well, it turns out that that was a finding that was based virtually exclusively on talking to divorced moms. Um, and when we tried to talk to a match sample of divorced moms along with divorced dads, we found that they there was a con considerable discrepancy in what they told us about almost everything, um, which when you think about it is kind of understandable. And, um, you know, there's a divorce his and a divorce hers. The problem with the previous research had been was that they only spoke to one side and that they believed it. So our research was, I think, in some sense, groundbreaking in, in, in the respect that we deliberately wanted to talk to um, all sides, essentially, mothers, fathers, children, teachers, um, established records of child support payments and so forth and so on. And as I said, we found that most of these ideas were myths. Now, um, I came to know of, uh, you in your introduction, you referred to me as a shared parenting advocate. And I, I wanna push back a little bit on that. I consider myself a pure researcher not, I, I don't really try to do uh, any, any advocacy work. It turns out that my research findings tend to accumulate on one side of the ledger. So when people talk about what I found, it makes me something of, a, of an advocate. 
but uh, I, I don't start out that way. I start just trying to find out what the facts are and then let the chips fall where they, where they may. And the chips have fallen in a way that uh, suggests that there's a lot of wrong information and the information condemns uh, divorced fathers needlessly. So I feel like I have, you know, cast, cast a light on that. And I've spent a good part of my career doing that. Uh, it was, uh, uh, I've had, I have, in addition to that book, I've published three other books. Uh, I have, I think a hundred something like peer reviewed articles uh, in in social science and law journals and this, and that sort of thing that um, are, uh, span a variety of topics, but um, but but I keep coming back to my sort of specialty and niche, which is trying to understand what's going on uh, with divorced fathers. So that sort of brought me to the attention of of uh, the National Parenting Organization. And uh, I have been uh, on their radar screen for um, quite a few years now. And, uh, get, and, and they've asked me to give talks to their organization and sometimes to give talks to legislatures and so forth. And I'm quite willing to do that. I, like I say, I don't feel like I'm advocating. I'm just telling it like it is based upon a, a, a pretty voluminous set of research that takes on a certain point of view. Well, that's a great uh, introduction. And uh, I want to go back and talk just a little bit about the bias that you found, uh, you know, originally, because, uh, I mean, you know, if you look at the history of, um, of research in this area, uh, it, I think you, you know, you, you probably we can safely say you're one of the very early researchers of this. Is that, is that correct? And, and, you know, I want to get into a little bit on the bias side, you know, because with research, you're always supposed to be unbiased. And in a good research paper, you'll always, you know, state what your biases are. And, you know, were you finding that people were stating that they had a bias or was this, uh, you know, an unknown bias to them? Well, prior to my research, I would say no. <laughs> the people weren't stating that. They, I, and in fairness, I'm not sure that they understood that they had a bias. Um, it was easiest for them for research. I'm talking researchers mainly. Um, and maybe people who picked up on research information to uh, gather sample, like for example, the uh, the child support information that we had talked about. Were, were that there was lots of findings about that, but it came from um, a, what the, a, a special census uh, um, studies, special set of c census studies, uh, offshoot of the census, where they where they they uh, investigated single mothers and they talked to the single mothers, and they just sort of, I think, made the mistake of under of believing that there was only one side of the story and what they heard was the truth, and so they did. So I don't know that they were conscious of a bias. Maybe I I, I don't want to pat myself on the back too much, but you know I I just had a different thought because of my training that, you know, there's people don't always say what the truth is. They say what the truth as they see it is. And, um, and, and, it, and it's important for researchers to develop mechanisms to triangulate on the truth. So that's, that was where I came in. But I think it's fair to say also, as you observed, that Maybe I, I was one of the early ones, if not the first, um, but there were a lot of people who followed in my footsteps um, and, uh, you know, who, who really kind of came up with the same basic set of information. So, you know, I'm, I, I'm really curious about the early stages of this, you know, did you get a lot of criticism? Because I can imagine you were sort of a, a lone voice there in the beginning, uh, kind of going against maybe, you know, what we would call established science back then. Uh, you know, did did, uh, did the criticism come out? You know, it came out in certain sources, but I would say not generally. I, I, I don't want to claim that. Um, it was, um, you know, there was certain strident feminist organizations 
that, uh, you know, tried to put me to task, take me to task. But, um, but after all, I got funded to the tune of hundreds of thousands of dollars and very competitive um, uh, activities trying to get federal research grants. So I think that uh, once, once I, uh, and, and I've never really had much trouble publishing my work in peer-reviewed pub publications. Um, so, so I think it may be fair to say that uh, I think it, in some ways it struck a responsive chord that, you know, there was this missing perspective. And, and in fact, that's, that was the title of my first research grant is something to the effect of, you know, we haven't heard we haven't heard this side of the story, and so we're missing something. And that, and 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 the the scientific review teams and so forth that uh, you know reviewed my work and in, in various venues, you know, seem to seem to recognize that that was so. Now, having said that, and also saying that, I'm not particularly. I don't see myself as an advocate. I don't go around. Writing, trying to persuade, you know, legislatures or um, or anything to my point of view. I, I'm a researcher. That's what I was trained to do. That's what I know how to do, and I'm at least okay at it, or at least I was. Now that I'm retired, I think my skills have eroded a bit. But um, but uh, so I, I I you know just let the chips fall where they may. Um, it's, it is kind of slow going, I think, in the advocacy arena. But I think, I, and I have said this, for example, at an at a NPO conference on shared parenting, I said that I think that the progress is noticeable. That if you compare uh, you know, laws and positions of 20, 30 years ago when I started my work to what it is now, there's a lot more joint legal custody. There's more fair, more understanding of fairness in child support collections. There's more, uh, m certainly in the prof professional community like, uh, like custody evaluators and that sort of that community, I think there's more awareness of that. You know, it's a good idea to keep fathers involved in children's lives as much as we can than there was before. Having said that, and I know probably a, a lot of your viewership will be saying something like, ah, "Yeah, but it's taken so long," or or something to that effect. I think social change <laughs> is a long process. And the, the question is, are we consistently moving in the right direction? And from my point of view, by right direction, I mean research, di the direction in which it's plain from the research that it's better for children, we are. And we are moving in that direction. Um, I feel I'm a, I'm a human being, and I hear a lot of st sad stories from um, people who have read my work and contact me who are just out there experiencing the system for themselves. And, um, you know, and I feel very, I feel very bad for those who haven't reached the end of the, who are those in the process where it's before the end of the chain where there's a, still a lot of suffering out there. But I do feel like things are moving in the right, inexorably in the right direction. Yeah, that's a really good point. And I, I often point that out to people, but uh, you know, it's, I, I point out too, that there's, there's speeds of change for different things, right? So society changes at one pace, the legal system changes at a completely different pace, I think from society. And then you have the research pace, which it seems like in this case, maybe the research is a little bit of a head uh, or maybe neck and neck with society and, and the legal system is, I think, still lagging a little bit. Is that a fair assessment, you think? I, 
think that's a very fair assessment. Let me give you another example. Um, in the book that I'm working on now, uh, which has to do with the perception of fairness from the community, what, what the community believes is fair in the family law system. Um, they, we, we found very clearly in study after study that the community believes equal custody is in general the best arrangement and the arrangement they would they would uh you know develop if they were in the, the shoes of judge of the judge so we've done a, a lot of studies in which we've um made up hypothetical cases uh for people to to say how would you do uh, what would you do if you were the judge and and a very high proportion uh say that they would do exactly 50 50 in this case but but when we ask them well what do you think would happen in the in the current legal in courts and legal environment men and women all say you know it's going to all shift in the direction of women um, women get all the time they get the money blah 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 so i think that the public really does understand that the system is unfair um, to fathers, biased in favor of mothers, and they wouldn't be. So in that sense, they are ahead. The, the community, the public is ahead. Researchers, you know, not 100% because researchers come in a variety of, of flavors, but, um, you know, I think the research community is now uh, very, you know, much, more um, understanding of the truth of the situation than they were 30, 40 years ago. Um, but as you say, the legal system takes a while to change. And the legal system is in part um, governed by um, political forces. So who speaks loud? most loudly in the legislature, because all these things are decided at the state level and state legislatures. So who speaks most loudly and who, uh, who, I have to be careful when I say that. You, you can't be strident. You've got to be, re you, you got to sound reasonable, but persistent. Give the facts. Don't sound like a crazy person. You sound like a crazy person when you approach the legislature, you'll be treated as a cra crazy person and dismissed. But um, that's one thing. Um, another thing is sort of legal precedent. And a third thing is, um, a third factor in this is the people who have a vested interest in the status quo. And so there are people in profession, in various professions, who who like to see the battle because they make money from it. Mostly, those are family law attorneys. A lot of family law attorneys are coming away, are coming are, are really giving up that point of view and really trying to um, talk talk sense to their clients. But others are just trying to make make for battle because the longer they can string out the trial and the bat you know the the more money they make and there are you know whereas probably the average divorce is, will cost the parents something like 10 10 to fifteen thousand dollars we have come across cases where it's thirty three hundred thousand dollars of legal fees so you know these people have an incentive to go the other way. So those are the two, I would say, counter forces uh, at that level. And, um, but as I say, I think, I think the outcome is inexorable. It's going in the direction that the National Parents Organization would like to see, but it's gonna take more years and more work by the National Parenting Organization you know, for that to happen. Change certainly is slow. Um, can we talk a few minutes? I, I, you've got a great, you know, long history here with this kind of research. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, 
where where did the history start and, and where where is it today and and then where do we need to go in the future with just on the pure research side well i i think i talked about where it was kind of where i began right yeah um it was a port it was a picture that largely portrayed the plight of single single mothers um without understanding or giving any attention to the other side um even to the children really um so it's come it's come away a ways it's moved along uh, the continuum still got a ways to go um but uh you know, I think the movement is in the right direction. Now, I can't remember the question you asked me. <laughs> uh, I was just asking, uh, you know, what what sort of uh, topics or what sort of research do you think is, is yet oh, to yeah. be done or, or needs to be done? Yeah, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, there's a lot. Um, there's a lot. And there's a lot of good people out there who have now found it a good, a good research uh, area for them to work, starting in, you know, starting in as young graduate students and moving along. Um, but I would say the most important is to continue to find out the answers to questions that people in who are working in the field need to know. So the professionals working in the field, like the judges, like the attorneys, like the custody evaluators, like there's a thing called parenting coordinators and, um, uh, 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 and such professionals need to know. I think it's worthwhile going to them to say, you know, what do you, what are the assumptions that you operate under? Do you think that they're questionable or we could, could be confirmed by additional information um, and so forth? And so, um, you know, that's a way to go. Now, one thing I think you'll want to talk to me about, so I'll jump the gun here, is um, is literally the, uh, you know, a paper that was recognized by your organization that I wrote with Ashley Votruba, um, who is formerly a grad student of mine and now is a professor at Nebraska. Um, she, uh, we, we, uh, looked at the research on whether shared custody or sole custody was better for children. And I think, you know, that's that's probably the starting point of the debate is how is it for children? There's certainly there's an argument to be made that how is it for the parents you know, is is this fair to the parents? Is that fair to the parents? But the starting point of the argument tends to be, well, what, what about the child? And in fact, the general law that supersedes all others is that the such decisions are to be made in, quote, in the best interests of the child. It's called the best interest standards. And so that's that's the guiding lamppost that people are supposed to go by. Um, there is now accumulated pretty a, a, a preponderance of pretty strong research in many countries. By the way, other there's a lot of countries that are quite quite far ahead of the United States in shared parenting, mainly the Scandinavian countries. Um, but those that research, which is very well done by very skilled researchers, tends to find example after example of shared parenting is on average the best arrangement for children. That when you look at large samples of children in various kinds of arrangements, the ones who are doing the best in the long term are those who enjoyed a shared parenting, shared parenting arrangement. Now, um, a re I think a very important caveat to that finding was uh, the correct point of view that it was based upon samples who chose um, a shared parenting arrangement. And how do we know that it was the shared parenting arrangement per se 
versus a self-selection of the people who chose shared parenting that was responsible for these better outcomes for children. And um, it's called the causal question. Keep in mind that the research uh, almost by, ne well, by necessity is not experimental research. Experimental research is the variant of research which you know can prove a cause and effect relationship to the satisfaction of most objective uh, uh, observers. But an experimental arrangement in this instance would be, well, we take a group of parents and we assign some of them at random to shared parenting and others of them at random to um, you know, a, a different arrangement. And that isn't gonna happen, it hasn't happened, it shouldn't happen. That shouldn't be a decision that's made based on the flip of a coin. It should be some sort of reasonable basis. But when it is that, when it, is, when it isn't an experiment, it isn't made at random, it's based on the base, it's, it's based on the choices of the parents involved most of the time. So most states, for example, um, you know, if, the, if both parents want shared parenting, they'll get it. But if one parent objects to it, um, it might not happen. It depends on the state. Most states aren't gonna force shared parenting on, um, on a couple, one of whom objects to it. So that leaves open the causal question. And Dr. Vetrubo and I um, took that as a starting point of our question. Is there, can, despite the fact that, you know, there's this kind of self-selection going on, can it be said pretty unequivocally that it is the shared parenting itself that causes that arrangement rather than the decision to adopt it but the arrangement per se that sets off a chain of processes that redounds to the benefit of the children. And in our review, we concluded that there was causal evidence. Um, at, least the, at least I think we'd say that there's enough evidence at the moment that that should be, that's our assumption, that's our understanding. That's the best conclusion to reach on the basis of this series of many, many studies involving hundreds of thousands of families all around the world, that, that, it, that it is a causal relationship that, if, that on average, if a judge imposes or if a couple chooses joint custody, their kids will do better because of that arrangement on average than if, uh, say they have uh, pri primary mother custody. So I, I bring this up in answer to your question of where does the research have to go? Well, I think we kind of answered that question, which, is a, which I think was a truly important, crucial question, but we didn't answer it fully and, and um, conclusively for all time. There, there needs to be more studies using different research designs. And we specify in our paper what kinds of, what kinds of those studies there should be um, that you know, could, could make the, the conclusion stronger or possibly, but unlikely, to make it more questionable. So that's, that's a really important question. And I think probably that's the animating question that your organization um, you know, cares about, um, can, you know, can, is shared parenting good for children? Um, and we think on the basis of the evidence that we've reviewed that it is. Yeah, certainly the, uh, I mean, the, to me and, and, uh, for me personally, as an advocate for shared parenting, the, the, the problem case is always the one where the, one person doesn't want to share custody for some reason when, you know, when there are two fit, willing and able parents, 
um, because that's what you need the laws for. It's, it's, you know, when the parents agree, that's fantastic, but you don't necessarily need laws to get parents, to, you know, when parents agree, you don't need the laws to state so. So um, I, I think it's always been interesting. And, and you mentioned about, um, you know, how you've observed this now in several countries. And I always think that's an interesting thing to look at because, uh, you know, the, the, the lawyers that are opposed to this always say, well, each family is different and everybody's slightly different and this sort of thing. And, and, and my, I always come back with, but if you look at this and how it's worked across different countries and nationalities and, and, you know, cultures, um, you know, there is a universal aspect to it. And, and in a lot of ways, I think the, the fundamental connections that we make as humans are, are really fairly universal. Yeah, I, I think that's true, but, you know, I, I don't want to go overboard and say, uh, uh, you've heard me use the word on average several times. Mm -hmm. And on av I think on average, we can say it's better, but I don't think we should go so far as to say it's better in every single instance. Right. Yeah. There are, there are exceptions. Now, what I, my response to, as you, as you described it, the attorneys who say every case is different. Well, um, yeah, at some level, every case has some aspect of it that's different if it's just the fingerprints of the people involved. But, but there's so much that's the same that, I mean, we can, we, you know, we can, we can identify various characteristics that should make it better or worse. Um, but the other thing I sort of have, have uh, claimed and written a paper about um, is, okay, let's assume you're right, that every, literally every case is different and needs an individualized uh, you know, set of processes and decisions. Do we have the tools to identify which which of the families do best under which circumstance? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, you know, pe people will say, well, some people will say, well, you know, we have this whole profession called the custody evaluator. And a custody evaluator is a, is a uh, mental health professional who gets paid very well, by the way, to perform um, a, a review on the family to, and then to advise the court uh, as to which would be better. But we've studied what tools those custody evaluators have at their disposal to make that judgment. And it's kind of not very persuasive that they that they have the tools at their disposal to do it. Actually, in our paper, uh, we we pointed out better tools that they could be using, better better uh, areas that they could be looking at. Now, I want to mention one of those because I think it's very important in a minute um, that make it better or worse. And um, and and but but on average, they are not the ones that are used by professional custody evaluators. So, and I think there's never been a study, I keep asking my peers if there's, if they know of one and the answer is never yes. Is there a study where you can study what we call the reliability or the cross reporter reliability of a custody evaluation? That is to say, you know, two, two professional custody evaluators look at the same case, look at the same raw data and then do they almost always come to the same decision? I think the answer will be no, <laughs> if they're not, you know, in, unless they talk to one another to try to combine on that decision. So, so the custody evaluators um, tools are not very precise. So I think it might be right to say, you know, every case is different at some level. It's always, it's a hundred percent true at some level. But do we uh, do we have the tools, the the um, do we have the tests, the abilities to discern which one, which kind of arrangement is really the one that's useful in this 
instant or not. And I think I think uh, that's it's not very it's not very persuasive. Now that's comes back to a question that you asked me earlier about where do we need to go? Well, that's an area that we really need to improve in, I think. And research should go in that direction. I'm I'm kind I'm kind of out of the business of beginning new research. I'm writing up the research that I've done. I haven't done a new study um, in fifty in ten years, I guess. But um, but you know during the 30 years that I was doing this, I did a lot of studies, but uh, collected a lot of data, spoke to a lot of couples and children and so forth. Um, but w one of the areas that I think is um, really predictive, but very overlooked um, in the professional literature as to whether this is going to be what kind of what kind of divorce will this settle on being is the question of interparental conflict. So we know, and I think it's uncontroverted that, uh, you know, if the, if the parents are fighting all together, which we call interparental conflict, are always at war, are yelling at each other, if they're trying to convince the child to love them better than they love the other children, the other parent, if they're bad mouthing the other parent, God forbid there'd be physical violence, anything like that. We know that's bad for kids, but the view, the consensual view, which I think is still the consensual view, is that interparental conflict is a couple level phenomenon. That is to say, it takes two to, it takes two to tango. It's the couple that's conflictual. And I think that, um, and I think I have some evidence now to suggest the couple is, it is not always the case that the two parents are equally conflictual. One, it could easily be the case that one parent is angry, dismayed, vindictive, and want to get back at the other parent. And the second parent maybe has moved on, you know, or for reasons having to do with character, just think, you know, I got to be the adult in the room. And many times it's the woman who's the instigator of, of this conflict and the man who is saying who has moved on. Many times it's the reverse. But I think we should do better in, in understanding um, treating conflict as an individual level phenomenon and trying to discern whether, you know, the, the couple is equally to blame for it or not. And so that's one area. The second thing I think we can do uh, about conflict is um, there are many who, who, in my view, wrongly treat conflict as a sort of given immutable characteristic of the family. That is to say, you know, there are, there are professionals who say, well, if the couple is fighting all the time, you can't give them joint custody. Um, that, that is a strongly held view of, of many professionals in the, in the field. But I say, well, that assumes that there's a lot of things wrong with that point of view, but one of the clear things is it assumes that the level of conflict is a given. You know, that's a, that's, that's a presupposition that we have to go into the case with, but it isn't. Conflict can change. The level of conflict can change. One of the things that will make conflict change is to decrease the incentive for conflict or increase the incentive for non-conflict. Non but others are just skills. So we have developed an intervention that is now being promulgated on, on, on cell phones, smart, smartphone intervention that teaches parents to how to, how to minimize the conflict between them. And it, and it works very well in the sense that as up against a placebo control group, you see couples diminish their conflict over time 
if they've been if they've been subjected to this intervention. So um, so co so conflict isn't a given that you have to just say if it's high, so wash our hands and run away. You know, there's things that can be done about it, and the two most important, as I said, are teaching the skills and techniques to minimize the conflict, just the passage of time. And, you know, and finally, we give too much incentive to make more conflict rather than to minimize conflict. Yeah, I mean, in a legal case, often the one that's creating the conflict is the one that will bear the fruits of the conflict, right? They, they want it to be conflictual because they'll get more, they have a better chance of getting what they want. And like you exactly. said, de de-incentivizing exactly. high conflict is certainly, I think, paramount to the legal system changing, um, you know, and, and that's, I, I think, irrespective of uh, the research. I mean, I, I think that's just really a, a flaw in how our legal system works. Exactly. Well, you know, the legal system is based on an ad, has been based on an adversarial model with the the notion that you know you hire the best attorney you can i hire the best attorney i can they battle it out and somehow the truth will emerge right that may be a maybe a good model a good approach in tort in personal injury in contract law it's not a good good model in family law where the family still needs to function somehow as a newly reconstituted family. So that that history, that embeddedness of the legal system in an adversarial model um, need, needs to change. And I think it is changing. I think there's things like many, fam many states have adopted what they call the friendly parent provision, which is something the law will say something like the you know, the that if the if the two parents are trying to battle for custody in some way, you should give an, the judge should give an edge to the parent who is most willing to bury the hatchet mm -hmm. and support the other support the parenting of the other parent. That's I, I I I haven't been too impressed with how that works in in practice, to be honest. But I think incorporating that that statute, that consideration into the legal system is a is a move to to the better. But I want to see more. Uh, I want to see more uh, implementation of it and figuring out how to put it into practice. Yeah, I certainly think we have a long way to go uh, as far as reforming our legal system. Um, I want to jump back and mention that uh, because you talked about it before, your paper does share parenting cause uh, children's better outcomes, and and you did win that um, that award from National Parents Organization. So congratulations on that. Um, any uh, advice to researchers out there that may be uh, applying for or uh, or doing this research and how they can get recognized uh, by the National Parents Organization? Because I know we do this as a yearly award. Um. um... I don't think I have any advice. To, my advice would be do really good research, <laughs> do the best you can, um, you know, use the best tools in the research, in the research armory, um, use random samples, good, you know, use, use uh, tried and true measures. Um, just do it right. And, you know, I think at least in the research community, supposedly, and I think in practice, as my, my own experience um, has been that if you, if you do rigorous research, it will command attention and it will sway at least other scholars. And when other scholars get swayed, then that'll have an impact on the system. So that would be my only advice. I don't know if that's the answer you were looking for, but... No, I, I think that's perfect. And uh, we're, we're kind of running up on time here. Is there anything else you want to talk about? No, I would just, yeah, the only other thing I would say is I've been an admirer of the organization for many years. Um, I'm trying to think how far back it was, probably during the 80s that um, 
Ned Holstein. I first met Ned Holstein and uh, was invited to give a talk to um, to the to the organization and um, and and it's just it's doing great work. Um, I keep, keep I always sympathize with those who say, "Yeah, but you know, I'm sitting here with this terrible case." Yes, you are, but your case will probably be if this makes you feel any better, then the cases that come after yours a few years from now will probably not suffer as much as you did. Um, the, the trend is unmistakable in the right direction. And I think it's because, um, you know, the, your organization values research and it values good research. And I think it's good research that will move the tide and so, um, you know, and so I think that's that's the only way. I mean, there may be some other ways, revolution, <laughs> but but uh, that's the way that I would favor in changing the tide. Well, Dr. Braver, thank you so much for coming on today. Is there uh, any way that people can contact you? Do you have a Facebook page or any sort of social media or any way uh, that people can contact you? The only social media I have is I do actually think I have a web page, but um, but I do have I do have email, and it's sanford.braver at asu.edu. I don't have Facebook. I don't have Twitter. 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 Sorry, I don't have Instagram. My kids do, <laughs> but I don't. Well, you, you certainly uh, probably have a lot more time in your day than, than the rest of us that are on the social now, media. Now that so. I'm retired, yes, I do. <laughs> well, thank you, Dr. Braver, for coming on. And uh, we look forward to uh, to hearing from you again. And uh, I, will, I will post uh, some information uh, linked to your the webpage at ASU with all of your contact information um, and also a link to some of your books on there. And uh, again, thank you so much for coming on and for all the work that you've done uh, over the years uh, for parents and, and families all over. Thank you, Chris. I appreciate it very much.